have the first, uh, and this was changed, uh, uh, first changed in 35 years in 1963. Uh, first adopted in 1925. Uh, and it did change for 35 years. But it did change for one thing. Society changes. The view of the family, if you remember, that's when 1963 is when things really started changing as far as uh, the structure of the family and the way, oh, I'm sorry, Timmy. The structure of the family. And so uh, this is the one we'll use. Let us understand as we go through our study that this is just a document about the role of family and, and uh, how the Bible affects. Our government and others in our nation trying to define the family is such a, needed standard that we as Southern Baptists need, no, must make uh, some uh, really uh, profound and uh, deep understandings. Now, if you'll notice, most of it is, it's going to be scripture. You're going to have a small statement, and then you're going to have a whole bunch of scripture that you can look up. So you can kind of do this on your own. Uh, this is not a creed, but is the most important book outside the Bible for giving us a handle on the doctrines that our Lord God came to teach. Please remember that. Amen? This is not the Bible. The statements aren't. You have to remember that. But I think that if I could do one thing to change the church, I would probably make sure everybody had one of these at their hands and put their hands on it. it. It tells who we as Baptists are. And like I say, I don't, the newest change, I'm not going with the newest change because I'm not at all happy with Southern Baptists right now. With some of the things that uh, we have, uh, 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 we see changing in our denomination, especially with the last uh, uh, several conventions. I was not happy. My first convention here was when uh, <clears throat> Baylor decided they were going to kick Southern Baptist out. And I'll never forget a director of missions at the time, Marvin Mosley, said, well, what that is like when they've decided to go behind closed doors and vote out any influence Southern Baptists have on the board, what that's doing is like me stealing Hope's car and letting her put the tires and gas in it. And that's essentially what happened with Baylor. In fact, when I see Baylor playing a football game, I root against them. They are not the crown jewel of Southern Baptists. But a lot of things have changed in Southern Baptist. And we're seeing our Southern Baptist Convention changing more and more to the world. This uh, reconciliation junk they've got going on right now is not something that, you know, let's concentrate the Bible. Everybody is precious in the sight of God. Uh, and so we've got several things that I want you to look at. It's easy to understand and gives us the scriptures to show us it is God speaking, not man. You got the scriptures. The faith is uh, intended to offer a reliable guide to where we as Southern Baptists stand on matters of faith and doctrine. It, it is our roots and our plan for how to live out the teachings of Jesus. There is no way to take the place of time and, the inf and take the place in time of the infallible word of God, the inerrant word of God, the Bible, is his word. The faith and message is an ad and an ad aid to helping you and I in our study of God's word. It's just an aid. It's not infallible. Uh, You're not reading the No. Nope. I'm just giving you what it is. There's no way to take the plate. Uh, okay, uh, we now have around uh, 15.9 uh, million members in our churches. We need this. We need that. Do you realize that the denomination you are a part of is the biggest Protestant denomination in the world, second only to Catholicism? What makes us different than some of the other branches of our Baptist family is the way we do missions. So, and I would not want to be able to do missions any other way because I think that if we're going to send a missionary and we're going to send our dollars to support them, they need to have some seminary and they need to have some experience. 
Uh, the best th uh, way that I can describe it is we had missionaries from uh, uh, other Baptist denominations come to the reservation, uh, the Ute Reservation. Those poor guys came from Texas, and they came up there, and they were going to set everything on fire, and they didn't understand anything about the culture. Didn't understand anything about the culture. If you'll notice that I very seldom put my foot up and put my knee on my, uh, my foot on my knee when I sit at the, at my sitting, and that comes from years and years. The biggest insult you can have is to show your heels and your bottoms of your feet to somebody, because that means you disrespect them. Well, and, and these guys come and didn't know any of that stuff. They didn't know it's considered impolite to point with your hands. In fact, I still tell Betty, come here. <laughs> and that's exactly how they do. The culture makes everything. And the one thing about us as Southern Baptists, we make sure that somebody's got some culture training, they've got some language training before they go overseas. They don't have to learn it the hard way. And so you've got this. Uh, what really led me to decide to do this is uh, our discussion on Scripture and uh, how do we know the Scriptures are uh, from God and how we know the Bible's from God. And so uh, you've got uh, uh, the 1962, the first page, page, well, it's going to be page three. Um, Where'd you get these tracks? Huh? The name of the church in there? Yeah. I have them back in the back, back there in the in the. I had them, no, I just had them in the cabinet. Pardon? I'm just yeah, I had them in the cabinet. In fact, I I ordered in a hundred of them uh, after I've been here a couple of years. And last time I went through it was probably three or four years ago. Because each new generation needs it. It's amazing how many people have been in Baptist churches all their lives and they've never seen the Baptist faith and message. And it's so easy. Uh, my, in fact, some of the churches I've been at has even had the uh, the co uh, the covenant on the board that we, you know, church covenant. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't have any of that. We don't practice church discipline either because we have a hard we have a hard enough time getting people here, much less discipline them. You know, if, if they're doing the wrong thing, the closest we've come is telling people that if they're not living a uh, a lifestyle they're supposed to live, then they can't teach the kids. I mean, that's common sense. Okay, now look, go ahead and turn to page 7. I love this. I think it gives a really good synopsis of this in capsule form. The Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is the record of God's revelation of himself to man. Amen? Amen. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Now that's a strong statement. Mm -hmm. Iner inerrancy of Scripture. It reveals the principles by which God judges us. Uh, and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of uh, Christian union. And the supreme standard by which all humans conduct creeds, religious opinions, should be tried. And the creation, uh, the criteria, uh, criteria by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. Say amen. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got a whole bunch of scriptures there. Look at God, number two. There is one and only one living and true God. He is Intelligent, spiritual, and personal being, the creator, redeemer, preserver, and the ruler of the universe. God is the infinite in holiness and all other perfections. To him we owe the highest level, love, reverence, and obedience. The eternal God reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with distinct personality attributes, but without division of nature, essence, or being. And then it goes on to tell you God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then it talks about man. Salvation. I love the one on salvation. This is on page 10. Salvation involves the redemption of the whole man. It is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
who by his own blood obtained eternal redemption for the believer. It is, in its broadest sense, salvation includes regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. Amen? Those used to be, when I first came into the ministry, and I've been here for 25 years and been had four, three other churches, this was everyday language. Everybody knew what regeneration, sanctification, and glorification were. Now, if you were to ask the main, uh, somebody that's been coming to church for years and years, most of them wouldn't know that. And I love the way it does it. Regeneration, or the new birth, is a work of God's grace, whereby believers become new creatures in Christ Jesus. It is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit through a conviction of sin, to which the sinner responds in repentance towards Christ and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are inseparable experiences of grace. Repentance is a genuine turning from, the, from sin towards God. Faith is the acceptance of Jesus Christ and the commitment of the entire personality to him as Lord and Savior. Justification is God's gracious and full acquittal upon principles of righteousness for all sinners who repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Justification brings the believer into the relationship of peace and favor with God. And then it tells you sanctification is the experience beginning in regeneration by which the believer is set apart to God's purpose and is able to uh, uh, progress towards moral and spiritual perfection through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Growth in grace should continue throughout the regeneration regeneration person's life, regenerate person's life. Glorification is the accumulation of salvation and is the final blessed and abiding state of the redeemed. Now, isn't that simple? You see how simple that is? But yet we don't use it. We don't get it out. We don't look at it. In fact, I pulled out some of my notes because I've done this. i got three folders from the times I've, I've preached all the way through this. And so, um, but uh, uh, we'll probably do that on, a, uh, on Sunday night if I decide to do that, if the Lord leads us here. Uh, uh, we have some that think this document is outdated and no longer needed. My understanding is that we must have the statement of who we are in Christ to keep us from bending the word around our times. There are always those that would lead us to leave our conviction and conservative roots and fit the word into our times instead of the other way around. That's what this does, is it not? And you can spend a lot of time looking up these scriptures. And I love the way that it just basically breaks down uh, uh, you know, uh, salvation. Look what it says about man, the next one up. Man was created by the special act of God in his own image and his crowning work of creation. In the beginning, man was innocent of sin and was endowed by his creator with freedom and choice. By free choice, man sinned against God and brought sin into the human race. Through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the commandment of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his uh, prosperity inherent a nature and an environment included towards sin. And as soon as they are capable of moral action, become transgressors and under condemn, uh, con uh, con condemnation. His holy, uh, his holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the creator purpose of God. The sacredness of human personality is evident in that God created man in his own image and in that Christ died for man. Therefore, every man possesses dignity and is worthy of respect and Christian love. Pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. It's even got God's purpose for grace. The church. It's kind of interesting what it says about the church. It's going to be on page 12. The New Testament church 
of the Lord Jesus Christ as a local body of baptized believers. See that, folks? Who are associated by covenant in their faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ committed to his teachings, exercising the gifts, rights, and the privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. What are the two... Uh, uh, what are the two ordinances? That's it. And we have completely changed a lot of that stuff. I even had somebody uh, a couple years ago come from one of the want to move their letter from one of the uh, one of the big churches in town. And I said, "Now, where's your where, where's your letter coming from?" She's got dual membership in the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church. And I said, how does that work? And said, well, preacher that accepted me by letter said that I could keep my uh, membership in the Methodist church and also the Baptist church. And, I, and all I was doing was trying to keep his numbers up. I mean, what we do in the, for the sake of numbers and for the sake of looking like we're growing and blowing is crazy. And, you know, a lot of the stuff is compromised in the mega churches because they don't require any of the ordinances to be kept the way the ordinances are. And, uh, you know, how do you join a Baptist church? By baptism. Biblical baptism. Okay? Uh, church is an autonomous body operating through democratic process under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And such a congregation members are equally responsible. Its scriptural officers are, are pastors and deacons. Hey, does it say elders? Huh. All these Baptist churches that are wanting to go to elders right now, you know why they're wanting to do that? So they can have women on there. No. So you don't have to have the qualifications of a deacon. The New Testament speaks also of the church as the body of Christ, which includes all of the redeemed of all ages. Amen? So you got the local church and you've got the universal church. Amen? I want you to notice it says a whole bunch about the local church and just gives you kind of a quick overview of the universal church. Why? Because we in our day and time want the, to belong to the universal church because what happens in a local church? There's accountability. If you're not here, you're missed. You're expected to do something. Baptism in the Lord's Supper. Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? 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 So why do we not accept other baptisms? Because they're not biblical. It is an act of obedience symbolizing the believer's faith is a crucified, buried, and risen Savior, the believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in the newness of life in Christ. It is a testimony to the faith in the final resurrection of the dead. Being a church ordinance, it is a prerequisite and privilege of church membership and the Lord's Supper. That's so easy to understand. But we've got those guys out there that are claiming to be men of God that are mixing the stuff up so much we don't have any rules anymore. We have become, instead of the church being the light and speaking out against uh, society and the wrongs of society, the church has been embracing the wrongs of the society. And we have backed up so much. <laughs> you know, I've told everybody, you know how we get our baptisms, don't you? Well, I'm going to go ahead and advertise <laughs> in the paper that if you'll come and let us baptize you, we'll put lottery tickets on the bottom oh. of the baptistry, and when you go under, you grab them. <laughs> well, we our, can you imagine how our baptisms would go up? But we have become a circus rather than standing up for Scripture. And Scripture is no longer important. What are a lot of pastors becoming now? Don't want to mention any names, Joel Osteen. But what is he? He is a motivational speaker. Prosperity gospel. Most, you know, and I've had people, it's funny because here several years ago, in one week, I had a guy tell me he was leaving the church, him and his family were leaving the church because I wasn't political enough. 
I needed to stand up for conservative values and be political. Him and his family were gone. The next week I had somebody come up and say, we're leaving because you're too political. <laughs> and then I've had people say, well, you know, we just don't want our sin. We don't want to hear about sin. We preached the full gospel. Amen? The whole gospel. And so you've got that. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine memorize, uh, uh, memorialize the death of the Redeemer and the uh, anticipation of His second coming. So, got that out, did we? No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Do what now? I said, I wish you'd just quit preaching right to me. I just do that at home. Thank you for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got some more. And like I say, I'll probably hit this real hard on Sunday nights. I was teasing him. He hears okay. that. A couple more. Yeah, but it works. I can order them pretty easy. Can you order the 1960? This is the 1963. Yeah, I mean, can we order these, the old one? I think so. Um, customer service center on the back. Yeah, but this is like from 1963. Yeah, but the thing of it is, is a lot of churches still use it. Most churches, most of your conservative churches are going to use this. They didn't go to the new one. All right. Once we as Baptists forget our conservative truths and sell out... To any time and place, the salt will lose its taste. Amen? And we will go in the, down the road of other denominations. Or we will start to lose people seeking the light. Our numbers will start to slip. I think we've seen that. Have we not? The message also helps us keep our bearings in a time when many are trying to lead us off the path of our roots. We, as SBC churches, would still count on some things being the same. This is one more reason to study the message. We are who we are for a reason. Now, how many of y'all have seen The River Runs Through? <laughs> you remember what, uh, uh, what the Methodist preacher said when his Methodist son asked him the difference between a Baptist, because he's going to marry a Baptist girl, and, and uh, a Methodist? <laughs> he looked at him and he said, well, son, I'm going to tell you. Methodist or Baptist that can read. <laughs> so when all is said and done, we need to hit a balance with the message and to not take it as the Bible, but not trash it like some are trying to do now. So we will seek the leadership of God's Holy Spirit and seek to find out why we are So, now here's where I'm going to go with this for right now. Because I really pondered, I spent my whole week pondering over this. Um, it's on the back, Hope on the back, it's got the address and stuff. Um, pardon? I thought this is the first time I've seen one. Really? Yeah. You've been in church all your life, just not having church. This is where we're going to go in here, I decided, and we may end up doing some things different, but biblical canon, amen? Mm -hmm. um, I think I've done this in such a way uh, <clears throat> that maybe you can hand this out to somebody and feel free to. 
<clears throat> on Scripture and the inerrancy of Scripture. Nathan, I think this might be something that you can, uh, people put their hands on. Before we start, we better get a very in-depth understanding of the word Scripture. And we don't. How many times do we use the word Scripture and we really don't? You know, uh, definition of Scripture. Hope, give me a definition of Scripture. God's Word. That's what, most of us, that's what most of us say, God's Word. When you say Scripture, what Gospel? It's supposed to be God's Word. Amen? But it doesn't say enough. I mean, you can say it's God's words. And so, hope, if I look at you and you say, well, the Scripture is God's word, and I say, well, how do you know it? So Maybe. I've been taught by my pastor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I'm going to give you a little bit of definition. I've changed it up a little bit, but I'll try to give uh, Scripture by the Holman Illustrated Dictionary. Historic Judo Christian name for the specific literature that the church reveals as divine instruction. Now, don't you like that a little bit better? What is Scripture? It's divine instruction. It's not just the Word of God. It's divine instruction. Scriptures means a writing. Rendering the Latin scriptura and the Greek garfia. Garfi, the term is used some 50 times in the New Testament for some of the Old Testament. Now, why would I tell you how many times it's used, Scripture is used 50 times? Because what is the New Testament doing? It is ratifying and reconfirming the Old Testament Scripture. And Jesus even quotes it. Say amen. Don't read ahead. Stay with me. Even Jesus does it. Amen. He quotes Scripture all the time. Why? To make the Old Testament relevant to the New Testament. Anybody that tells you the Old Testament's not relevant because it's under the law, you better flee from. They need not teach you anything. Because we've got those people that are so afraid of, uh, of legalistic and being legalistic that they don't take anything of the law. And you cannot live God without living his laws. That doesn't mean that you get there by his laws, but you glorify him by his laws. There's a huge difference, amen? I'm not getting to heaven by Jesus or, and by the scripture's laws. But what I am doing is glorifying God his way, not my way. And that's a big thing we have to look at. How many of us want to glorify God our way and not his way? And we use grace as an excuse to do our own thing. To live our own lives the way we want to. Fifty times in the New Testament. Scriptura. Boy, that's Latin, isn't it? Isn't that cool? In the history of the church, the divine character of Scripture has been the great presupposition for the whole of Christian teaching and theology. So where do we get where do we get our lessons from? Where do we get our teaching from? Did I not tell you at the very beginning the Baptist study Bible or the, the Baptist message is if it's not scripture, it's it's it can be fallible. How many times have I told you about uh, and warned you about the study Bibles? I don't care how good the study Bible is. I don't care how good the person that got it together or the people that got it together are. Guess what? We're fallible. The only one that's not fallible you know is me. Whoa. <laughs> Lightning's going to strike now, just like it was this morning. If you want to see how fallible I am, ask Betty and the boys. And ask some church members that have quit that hate my guts. So, you know, we have, uh, we're all fallible. Say amen. amen. But the word of God is not. It's inerrant and perfect. So it's used for what? Preaching theology. This is apparent in the way the New Testament speaks about the Old Testament. New Testament writings often used formulas like God says and the Holy Spirit says to introduce Old Testament passages. Amen. Isn't that good to know? Doesn't it just make you feel good to know that? And to see that and finally be able to wrap your head and your heart around the idea. You know what? You know what? It's the inerrant word of God. Why? Because it supports itself. I told Nathan here a while back, you look at how we know the scriptures. The scripture is the, uh, is the external evidence and the internal evidence. Hermeneutics. But also remember one thing. I'll never forget when Dr. Potts says, now, young preachers, you're taking this class, you're going to learn how to take scriptures apart, you're going to learn the Greek and the Hebrew, 
don't forget to put them back together. Because it's easy to tear up scripture. It's hard to put them back when your faith starts to lag. Okay. Uh, for the New Testament authors, scripture was the record of God speaking, revealing himself to his people. Is that not what we just read in the Baptist Faith and Message? The scripture, of uh, the scripture and God are so closely joined together that the writers could speak of scripture doing what it requires what it records God doing. Galatians 3.8 The scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying all the nations shall be blessed in you. Now that's, that's really way back, is it not? God uh, saying that? And then you've got Romans 9.17 I didn't put it down but you can look that up if you want to. Okay, now A. Because of their belief in scripture divine origin and content, the New Testament writers described it as strongly confirmed, trustworthy, deserving all, uh, deserving of full acceptance and confirmed. Its word endures forever. Uh, Catherine, yes. look up 2 Peter 1.19. Please. Uh, Betty, 1 Timothy uh, 115 uh, Miss Robinson Hebrews 2 uh, 3 and uh, Nathan 1 Peter 12, uh, 1 23 through 25 if you forget where they're at they're on the page in front of you Hope I need you to look up Romans 9 33 and when you get there you can uh, uh, let me know uh Okay, Catherine, strongly confirmed. Uh, he, uh, uh, second Peter. Did I say first Peter or second? Second Peter. Second Peter. Okay, one nineteen. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to be as the light that shines in the dark in the dark places of the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Amen. Pretty good stuff. All right, Betty. Got First Timothy. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't. That wasn't where I was supposed to be. If his faith is in the worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am. Amen. Amen. Confirmed. Hebrews two three. But what makes us? Nathan, endures forever. Don't you just love that? That is one of my favorite scriptures that the word of God endures forever. It won't wither like the grass. Amen? Those who build their lives on scriptures will not be put to shame. Hope. Bible is written for instruction and encouragement. Mm -hmm. Romans 15.4 To lead to salvation through faith. 2 Timothy 3.15 To guide people towards godliness. Amen? We forget that. Mm -hmm. We forget that. We want to get saved all we saved and just live the way we want to. And we want a wow moment every once in a while in the scriptures. But when it comes to living it, are we really living it? And to equip believers for good works. Amen? Where do you get your how do you know what good works are? Folks, I want to tell you something, and I want you to understand this. Society tries to tell us what good works are. And society's good works change from generation to generation. 
Um, used to be in the old days that uh, where I came from, and they talked about it, was the person that had the most horses was the most prosperous. And it's all right to steal a person's horse. But then you come to the West, and what do the white guys say? We'll hang you for that. So my point is, is that culture teaches us right from wrong, and culture can be wrong. In our society today, we are slipping very, very quickly into Roman lifestyle that destroyed Rome. Hey, remember what I told you about China and what their ambassador, or their, uh, ambassador to the United States says? We don't have to shoot a bomb at you. You guys are going to destroy yourselves from inside. All we have to do is get a few germs and spread them. All we have to do is make you fight amongst yourselves. To have a double standard for those that do and those that don't. Don't know about you, but man, I thought it was pretty bad when some of those people were telling us we had to mask up and we had to stay inside. We're caught on camera in restaurants and in places not masked and at weddings even. Yeah. You know, rules for you but not for me. And so as we look at this and as we see that, we even have today, marriage is redefined. Just because the Supreme say it doesn't mean it's so. Just because Congress makes a rule on it doesn't make it so. And just because the President writes an a, a executive order, those things change with every President. You know, and they come along, instead of keeping what was good, they throw out everything. I thought the idea of getting a new president was that he was supposed to improve on what was already there, not destroy it. Our society is wrong on the family. And when we start letting people redefine the family, and we start letting people redefine how we're supposed to live and what is right and what is wrong, that's why Scripture is so important. Amen? Amen? What is scripture? It's the fence that protects us from ourselves. The purpose of scripture is to place men and women in right standing before God and to enable believers to seek God's glory in all the life's activities and efforts. It is above all a book of redemptive history. Why is the Old Testament so important? Well, it's like I told you on Sunday night. We're going to be looking at, uh, at uh, Daniel 1, 8. Where Daniel makes up his mind, he's not going to eat the stuff he's not supposed to eat. What does Mosaic Law say? It tells you what you're to eat and what you're not supposed to eat. And what's really interesting about that, folks, and, and think about this for a second. You go back and look at what the Jews could eat and couldn't eat. There was a reason for why they couldn't eat some of the stuff they ate. Why couldn't they eat shellfish? You talk about sal manila poisoning. That's where it comes from the quickest. Why couldn't you eat off the, hand, uh, the hind quarters of an animal? But well, if you work the kill floor like I did, when you miss in the intestines or the gut, where does it go? It doesn't go on the hind front quarters. It goes on the hind quarters. And so what does that do? The hamburger that you have recalled and contaminated a lot of times is because of that. Because it wasn't processed right. Now, hope, don't forget about that when you have your hamburger tonight. <laughs> and, but my point is, is a lot of that stuff is just practical. A lot of that stuff and a lot of the laws of God are not because God wants to be an authority and not because God wants to tell you what to do. They're for your protection. Why did the manna come? And what does Jesus say? Moses didn't provide it. Your heavenly Father did. Amen? What did it protect them from? Not only starvation, but food poisoning. And then they had quails. And I love that scripture where it says they ate them until they came out their ears. <laughs> you ever ate something until it came out your ears? I would hardly eat a pinto bean. We had them for three meals a day sometimes when I was a kid. Because they were free and we had to grow them. I can eat Pinto beans now in chili. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll never forget, I still to this day have a real problem eating uh, uh, my grandma, if my grandma was still around, her preserves. She had some uh, peach preserves. And I got into the cellar. And in Colorado, it's different because we stored everything in a cellar. I mean, I can remember going down to my grandma's place, and in the cellar, there would be lines and lines of, uh, of vegetables and fruits and all the things that they had canned through. Man, I got me three bottles of that. <laughs> Preserves. I got a loaf of bread. Snuck out the back door, ate that stuff till it come out my ears. It was years before I could even smell it. <laughs> God protects us from ourselves. That's what Scripture's all about, amen? Scripture is not only a divine book, but also a divine human book, amen? It is important to realize that the biblical writers employed the logistical resources available to them as they wrote in, uh, Pacific, uh, to Pacific people with particular needs or particular time. I'm going to stop there. In fact, everybody circle three. We'll start there next time. The purpose of Scripture is to place men and women in right standing. Amen? Because that's where we're going to go. Also, if you'll notice on this, we go a little bit further after this, after I get to talking about Scripture, because it's important for us to know what Scripture is. Amen? Is that kind of helping on Scripture? And uh, see the formation of the, can of the canon. Inspired inspiration of scripture. We'll look at that a little bit later. So you got quite a bit of material here. So we'll be in that a while. And then like I say, somewhere along the line we may hit the Baptist faith and message. Okay. Uh, oh. Catherine. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to answer your question about scripture through this. Is it helping? Your question about uh, Satan and being the most beautiful angel in heaven. There are biblical texts that explain to us their origin of Satan. Many people get surprised to find out that he was first one of the most honored and beautiful angels in heaven. And we find that in Ezekiel 28, uh, 12 through 17. The Son of Man take up lamentations over the... Y'all can turn there if you want to. Ezekiel 28, 12. Because I've told you all, if you ask a question, I may not answer it. I try to answer it to the best of my ability, and if I don't, then I'll try to swing around and answer it. I'm taking Jen Saki's thing. We'll circle around. She circles around to everything. I'm going to circle around to everything, too. Ezekiel 28? Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17. Now, you're not going to be able to understand Revelation to, to a bigger extent without two books of the Old Testament particularly, Daniel and Ezekiel. Sorry, see the scripture one more time. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17. All right, everybody there? Sorry, right, Hope. I'll, I'll let you turn there. Go ahead. Oh, I'll try to Or no hurry. Timmy, you go ahead and turn that off. Yeah. Yeah.